So a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, we are very happy that so many of you are joining this event. I'm Sarah Rippert, Project Officer in the International Politics Division at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And together with uh, Jaime Fernandez Medina from Bed of the World, um, I will be moderating this event. As you know, we will talk today about the massive upscaling of renewable energy and how this impacts pastoralism in the drylands of Africa, Asia and Latin America. On this topic, we have commissioned a study titled Pastoralism and Large Scale Renewable Energy in Green Hydrogen Projects, whose main results will be presented today by the two authors, and Waters Bayas and Hussein Tadichabario. I will introduce them in a second, but beforehand, I quickly wanted to mention the project this study is part of. So since this year, the Heinrich Böll Foundation and Bread for the World have a joint project called Green Hydrogen, Sustainable Investment in Fair Trade, where we are aiming to create a set of sustainability standards and criteria that help to ensure that the emerging hydrogen market is truly sustainable, taking especially into account the perspectives and the context of likely hydrogen exporting countries in the global south. And for this, uh, we have a twofold approach. So on the one hand, we have different studies um, that are produ produced. So on the opportunities and risk for those countries, but also on policy instruments, how to regulate the international trade with green hydrogen and so on. And all these studies serve as scientific background for the project. Um, but then on the second hand, we also have national stakeholder cons consultations that are carried out across um, different likely hydrogen producing and exporting nations. And in these countries from the global south, among them Chile, Brazil, South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia and Colombia. Uh, the criteria is elaborated from the bottom up in workshops together with the stakeholders. And all these results will be brought together in a so-called global synthesis, um, where we will outline the main criteria and recommendations, and which we will share widely with national and international partners and policymakers. And we expect to have this document by autumn. And I do not want to hide that one of the main forces of the project driving us is your Kaas, uh, head of the International Politics Division at Heinrich Böll Foundation, who is also today with us, uh, but more in the background and who also strongly contributed to the study we will talk about today. And the study is the first uh, of our publications and talks about the potentials and threats coming along with large scale renewable energy projects and pastoralism. And the two authors will tell you definitely more about this, but I just want to quickly introduce them. So um, with us, we have Dr. N. Waters Bayas, who is an agricultural sociologist and who specializes in innovation processes that enhance local adaptive capacities in agriculture and natural resource management, including pastoral systems. She's a member of the international support team for Polinova, which means promoting local innovation in ecological oriented agriculture at the Agricole Association for Agriculture and Ecology. This is a German based non governmental organization that promotes site appropriate farming systems worldwide, including also pastoralism as a form of agroecology suited to the drylands. And Waters Bayas has devised several organizations in Sub Saharan Africa and pastoral and livestock system development and also in participatory research. She's core group member of CELEP, the Coalition of European Lobbies for Eastern African Pastoralism, and member of the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralist Global Coordination Group. So, also very warm well welcome to you, and nice to have you with us. And then we have Dr. Hussein Tadi Chavario, um, who holds a master's in natural resource management and sustainable agriculture from the Norwegian University of Life Science and a PhD in agriculture science from the University of Kassel here in Germany. 
He has over 13 years of experience and development and research work among the pastoralist communities of Northern Kenya and Southern Ethiopia. Among others, he has worked for Care International in Kenya and for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, on land governance and natural resource management. He is ex executive director at the Center for Research and Development in Drylands in Masabit, Northern Kenya. And as a nonprofit organization, CRDD, which is a short abbreviation, promotes people-centered research and development to contribute to the sustainable livelihoods of communities living in the dry land. And this is also one of the East African partners of CELEB. So I'm very happy that you found the time to be with us today, Anne and Hussein, and I'm now looking forward uh, to your presentation and would hand over to you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for this introduction. I will pull up my PowerPoint here. Uh, right, there we are. I hope you can all see it. Uh, I'd like to thank also uh, Heinrich Böhl Foundation and Bread for the World for commissioning us to do this study and also for inviting us to present it to you now. Um, I'll bring, first of all, the general findings, and uh, then Hussein will introduce uh, two projects uh, in Kenya, one positive, one negative, and he'll also bring our overall uh, recommendations and conclusions. So in the past, most governments gave little value to the drylands. They regarded them as, as marginal, low potential. But now, however, the need for a transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy is giving new value to these vast open spaces where energy can be produced in dryland areas that have been used for generations by local people. The investors often ignore the rights of these traditional land users, most of whom are pastoralists, that is, people who as their main source of livelihood raise livestock by moving their herds to graze dispersed patches of vegetation in different seasons. Now this study has two main aims. One of them was to influence uh, policymakers to shape the expansion of large scale renewable energy projects uh, in the dry land so that it does no harm. And the second was to make pastoralists better prepared to deal with this expansion. We focused here on large scale land acquisition for solar and wind energy projects, uh, also for producing green hydrogen, uh, but we did not uh, look at geothermal or hydropower projects. Now our study was based mainly on a global literature review, but we examined some cases in more detail in the countries that you can see highlighted here in this map. And Hussein also interviewed some stakeholders in Northern Kenya where he lives, and uh, he's now in the process of doing a deeper going study in that area. So what are the current trends in the energy sector? Solar and wind power production is expanding quickly worldwide in efforts to meet the global demand for carbon-free energy. And the national commitments made in the Paris Agreement to reduce CO2 emissions, several countries, have set targets for 100% renewable energy already by 2030. And now pressure is even greater. The war in Ukraine has led to rising energy prices, with several European countries, including Germany, seeking alternatives to Russian oil and gas. There's a keen interest to produce green hydrogen for e-fuels for industry and transport using solar and wind power often generated elsewhere, such as in the African drylands. Governments and investors have recognized that the drylands are excellent sites for producing solar and wind power because they have high solar irradiation, often high wind speeds, they tend to be fairly flat, and they are sparsely populated. Green energy projects close to cities often face resistance from inhabitants who generally have more influence than do the people in the dry lands. So in India, in Kenya, Morocco, and Norway, 
We found cases where large scale green energy projects were set up in the drylands without adequate consultation with the local land users and without their free prior and informed consent, FPIC. Most pastoralists graze their herds on common property land that the state holds in trust for its citizens, but the state often did not honor these traditional land rights. It used narratives of making unused or degraded land productive to justify land grabbing for environmental purposes, so-called green grabbing. Investors acquired large areas for their energy projects, blocking livestock access, fragmenting the grazing areas and hindering herd movements. This constrained pastoralists' ability to be resilient to climate change, above all, through their mobility. Now, mobile pastoralism is the most viable agricultural production system in the drylands, but many governments don't realize what they're destroying. They greatly underestimate the contribution of pastoralism in terms of ecological, low external input food production and ecosystem services, and they therefore give little value to this land use. Now this puts pastoralists in a weak position to negotiate continued use of the land or compensation for its loss. And in most cases, during project planning, the pastoralists were not well informed, if at all, about the plans or their rights, and were not well organized to defend their land or to negotiate terms. So when solar farms with ground mounted panels were set up, the herders usually lost access to the pasture beneath and between the panels. Now, wind farms, in principle, should interfere less with grazing, as the turbines have a fairly small footprint in the wider landscape. But in most cases, the herders felt that their land and cultural rights had been violated and therefore started to resist the projects. Now, one such case is the Lake Torcana wind power project in Kenya, where the local people went to court, and Hussein will tell you more about that. And also late last year in Norway, a court ruled that the licenses issued by the government to erect wind turbines on land used by Sami herders violated the Sami's cultural and civil and political rights as it interfered with their protected cultural practices of reindeer herding. The Sami demanded that the turbines be torn down, but they're still standing. The dispute continues. Thus, many energy projects led to lose-lose situations. The customary land users, the herders, lost access to pasture, water, and their main source of energy, firewood. Their herd migration routes were cut. The resilience of their overall pastoral land use system was decreased. Many energy companies experienced conflicts with local people, protests, blockades, damaged infrastructure, which led to construction delays, higher costs, or even complete project failure. Thus, there are not only ethical, but also good business reasons why energy companies should be interested in taking another approach. But thus far, in most cases, the biggest losers have been the herders. Here is some summary of some of the negative effects that I've already mentioned. But what we want to underline here is that human rights principles, if these principles and if the legal systems for recognizing rights to common property resources are not applied, more and more herders will lose their land to green energy projects and will become poorer. And this will fuel conflict, hopelessness, and emigration, and would be the height of climate injustice. However, we also found a few cases where good consultation processes were carried out, and the energy company and the local community reached agreement on shared use of the land. In Mexico and Northern Canada, and also one Kenyan case, which Hussein will talk about, Local communities benefited from green energy projects through receiving equity shares in the company and managing community trust funds fed by energy revenues. 
Scientific studies have shown that green energy production can coexist with grazing and can even improve animal welfare and production. For example, solar panels and wind turbines can provide shade for livestock, such as you see here. However, the cases of coexistence were mainly in the USA and Australia, where pastoralists are ranchers with private land ownership or leases. They could negotiate directly with the energy companies. The situation is much more complex in countries where pastoralists use common property resources, and they normally have no legally recognized title to the land and the water that they use in different seasons. And now, Hussein will tell you more about the situation of, in one such country in Kenya. Hussein, please. Uh, thank you, Anne. Hello, everyone. As introduced, my name is Hussein Tadichawario. I'll pick up from where Anne has left off to present to you two case examples. Of course, as she has said, one positive and one negative on, of pastoralism and green, um, large scale green energy projects in Kenya and Rylands. And I will end the presentation with overall conclusions and uh, recommendations of the study. Just to give you a brief background, um, the Kenyan drylands are also referred to as the arid and semi-arid lands, or commonly referred to as assholes. They comprise over, comprise over 80% of Kenya's dryland mass. And it's shown in uh, cream and um, orange uh, in the map here. And the main economic state of people in the assal region is pastoralism. The region was marginalized by colonial and as well as independent governments and thus remained underdeveloped relative to other parts of the country. In recent decades, however, following constitutional changes in 2010, the, the broadened devolved form of governance, there's, an, there's been improvement in infrastructure. And this has opened up now on the assault potentials and has increased interest, investment interest, some of which require large scale land puzzles. Among the projects uh, requiring such large scale land uh, green energy projects, such as wind farms. And now I present two examples here to demonstrate negative and uh, positive experience. And I start with um, the Electrocana wind power, which exemplifies now a negative experience of green energy projects here in Northern Kenya. Electrocana wind power is currently the largest um, wind farm in Africa. And the project uh, acquired 60,700 hectares of land from the communal rangelands. And it acquired this from the Marsabit County Council then, which was uh, hold the land in trust with minimal consultations with the community. The land had been used as pastures by Turkana, Samburu, Rendili, and El Molo herders. This project is completed in 2019 and now has 365 turbines and generates 310 megawatts of electricity worth US dollars 700, 700 million. Communities in the area barely benefited, getting only a few employment opportunities and a few corporate social responsibility projects. And because of this now pastoralists uh, actually resisted uh, this particular project and they expressed uh, displeasure with this project uh, looking at a number of issues. One of the key thing was there wasn't adequate consultation as mentioned, because only a few uh, leaders in the county council at the time approved the decision. And then the land was transferred. The ownership of the land was transferred regularly from communal to the private investors. And generally the committee regarded this as illegal even at the time, because um, even then they were supposed to have been formed a planning committee um, a land board, land divisional board committee that was supposed to include community representatives in it, which was not done. And there was no compensation for the land. It was regarded as an empty landscape, investable sort of terrain. Moreover, of the 60,700 hectares acquired, only 16,000 were used for installation of the wind turbines. The committee therefore questioned why the extra lands were acquired. Therefore, the community resistance this went to court in 2014, actually when the construction began, but only in late 2021, after about six years that the court ruled that the land acquisition process for the wind park 
has been illegal, but then already the wind park was already in full operation and the court recommended that the acquisition needs to be regularized. That is the company needs to get a legal title from the government. Despite this exceptional win, the local communities were not happy with the court decision, which in their opinion was just legalizing the illegality. They demanded that the land title be revoked and fresh negotiations for the land started. Also, the court rejected the community's player to stop the operation of the wind farm until a new agreement was reached. There are many of such cases. However, within Kenya itself also, another positive uh, case exists. And one of them here is the Kipeto wind farm. And the Kipeto wind farm we present here has a positive example. It's a 100 megawatt energy project located in Southern Kenya in the Masayo pastoral rangeland. It was completed and commissioned in 2021. Here the land uh, is owned and managed by Masai families as group ranches. Uh, the wind farm negotiated and established the project on land owned by 60 families, Maasai families, including 10 women. Although the consultations were complicated, it was time consuming and heavy in terms of you know, financial investment. But finally, it resulted in a win-win agreement both for the families and the investors. So just to enumerate, um, this particular wind in a farm, uh, the negotiations yielded a number of positive outputs for the families and the community. One is they provided annual lease payments for landowners for the land where the turbines were erected. They also provided a 1.5% annual gross revenue from the wind farm, which at the time was estimated at 12,000 US dollars per turbine, which was to be compensated to the owner. And they made an offer of equity to the community, which was valued at US dollars 1 million, and the community was to get this annually. Additionally, um, they offered also 5% revenue share for the community, commencing when the project becomes operational. And this was to be channeled to a community trust fund managed by the community themselves. And they constructed also 18 modern houses for families that, that were relocated uh, to a safer distances from the turbines. Additionally, they also did uh, various, of course, the corporate social responsibility projects that benefited other communities in uh, the county. Also, uh, all this, however, was only possible because the community land community had legal support, you know, from um, a lawyer who was from the community. Now, in terms of now, uh, uh, those are the two examples. Now, moving to you know how we can just transition to green energy then be facilitated. In our report, we therefore make several recommendations to this. And these were for researchers, for civil society organizations, including personal organizations with a view uh, to protecting um, the rights of personalists and helping them gain scientific evidence to strengthen their position to negotiate with green energy projects. And today, however, we highlight the recommendations for policymakers in countries where green energy projects are being set up, as well as in energy importing countries like Germany, as well as for energy companies and investment banks. Uh, some recommendations for the government policymakers include there's need, the need to draw up national strategies for consultation with all local land users, wherever large scale expansion of renewable energies, including green energy is being planned, to set up country frameworks that define parameters for benefits from green energy projects, and also to ensure that affected pastoralists have legal support for negotiations with energy developers and access independent conflict mediation and to support participatory planning for multipurpose land use that integrates green energy. Hydrogen importing countries should require in their frameworks for procuring and certifying green hydrogen that it comes from projects that meet global human rights standards. Some recommendations again for energy companies and as well as um, project planners. Um, they need to implement existing and um, international and national business standards and codes of conduct. They need to be aware of project risk and costs if human rights are not respected. And they also need to seek understanding, they, they, seek, they need to seek 
to understand the existing forms of land use by multiple communities with multi-layered rights of land use, including seasonal rights of mobile pastoralists. They need to engage with local land users early in the project process, as well as jointly exploring with communities you know, the multi-purpose land use that offer, includes uh, green energy generation. And some few recommendations also for um, investment banks. They need to ensure that human rights uh, impact assessments are carried out and all required social and environmental safeguards are met. There's also a need for investment banks to continuously monitor that the projects um, implement the existing standards, codes, including the human rights and land trainer guidelines. Um, in conclusion, therefore, I say that um, as the world urgently needs an energy transition, green energy production will expand still further into the dry lands. Here, the challenge is to find how climate injustice to pastoralists can be prevented, including inclusive participatory design of energy projects within multifunctional land use could promise or optimize or overall land use efficiency for pastoralism, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, rural economic activities, and energy production. This could create a win-win situation for pastoralists and green energy, but only if the voice and agency of pastoralist communities are strengthened so that they can negotiate good terms for coexistence and co-benefit with the energy investors. Governments, on the other hand, need to manage the energy transitions carefully in open discussion with well-informed civil society, especially the pastoralists. Only then can damage on their rights and livelihoods be averted and equitable transition to renewable energy be made. With that, I say thank you and thanks to you also for listening. So thank you very much, uh, Hussein and Anne, for this very enlightening presentation and also for all the insights you gave us from your work on the ground. Um, we will now move on and have two commentaries from Kirsten Westphal and Christian Schnorr, whom my colleague Jaime Fernandez will present and then open up the discussion um, also for you, the audience. So um, please, Jaime, uh, take over and introduce the two. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And good afternoon to, to our speakers and to all participants joining from, from different countries. I am Jaime Fernandez from Bread for the World, um, Port Filibert, uh, working at, at the Policy Department on Energy Issues. Um, I would like to introduce our next speakers, Kirsten Westphal and Christian Schnorr. Um, Kirsten Vespa is executive director at the um, H2 Global Fund Foundation, whose mission is to, to promote the production and use of green hydrogen on a national and international level. She's a member of the National Hydrogen Council and has worked at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, where, among other things, um, she led the project um, Geopolitics on the Energy Transition Hydrogen. Then Christian Schnorr is the spokesperson for ABO Wind, a private company based in Germany that develops and builds wind and solar farms, as well as battery and hydrogen um, projects around the world, including in Canada, where the company has um, hands-on experience with First Nations um, pastoralists. Our speakers will react to some of the findings from the report that, um, that was just presented specifically touching on issues that relate to planning of energy projects, land acquisition process, consultation and human right principles. After the um, intervention, we have time for an open discussion where um, you, the participants, can pose your questions to the authors of the report, as well as to Kirsten and, Christi and Christian. To participate, you can raise your hand in the, in the Zoom, Zoom application, and when we call on your name, you will be able to unmute yourself to post, post your question. Alternatively, um, you can also write your question in the Q&A section in the Zoom um, application. So in the, it's a Q&A section, not the chat section. And then we can read um, your questions at, at loud. 
So with that, um, I would like to I would like to hand over to to Kirsten. Thank you very much, Jaime, for introducing me, and thank you very much to Anne and and Jose for for great presentations. And I all um, urge you to to read the studies. I think that they are very important because they present very different but very illustrative stories which stories which i think is is very important um, as we develop um, large-scale renewable energy projects worldwide and as well as both electricity but also hydrogen my first point and i i i like to make four points and then have a fifth point with more questions back to the authors and to all of us and my first point is I, I found the stories and cases so enlightening because they they make the well-known energy water food nexus very tangible and they break the cases down to exactly this, this point of land use for pastoralism. But also, of course, we have to have in mind agriculture as well. So this green grab, and they also point to cascading effects into local communities. Now, I think that's very important that you, that you have stories to follow and, and to better understand what are the, the, um, the, the, the yeah, cascading effects, basically, um, and what is happening and how that could lead into, into conflict. My second point is, um, and this is where I'm struggling and where I think we are in dire need for good solutions. And the good uh, message is that your studies with um, the, the um, recommendations present actually ways out is that, of course, we have to openly face that whenever we intervene in the status quo, we want to have the positive effects, namely harvesting green electricity, green molecules. But of course, this has also collateral effects and damages. And this is something where it's, it's really a, a political challenge to minimize and mitigate these collateral effects and negative effects. Because I, th I think this is something that we have to take quite for granted, that if we want to have large effects, you have, of course, an impact on the existing status quo and environment. And in that regard, I, I, I wonder whether it's politically necessary to have this kind of prioritization and hierarchy of issues of public interest. I'm, and I'm not giving an answer, but I think just to navigate through these challenges, um, does this help? And do we, have a, a, to, do we need a prioritization? My third point is that I really liked the recommendations um, and that this is that it is necessary to to look into a free and prior and informal consent as, as, as you call it with the local communities to start exchanging prior to the building up in order to also have um, the idea of empowerment, participation, also accountability of the companies and, and yeah, actually equity shares and a fair distribution of the benefits of, of the project. And this is, I think, a major challenge where we still have to look and we as, as, as Europe looking into huge projects, we as H2 Global, a pu public private um, entity um, and a, a um, public private and nonprofit organization, we, we have to under better understand how to how to uh, balance um, both the benefits that have to stay in the country, but as well as maybe even a necessity to export something in order to kick off um, a renewable energy um, development um, in the specific countries. My fourth point is, and this is, comes out very clearly out of the studies, that indeed we need criteria, as it has been said, both for the product as such, and we tend to talk a lot about the, the green criteria of the product, but also, as you say, for the projects with regard to sustainable development goals and respecting those. Um, and, and you also mentioned human rights, and I, I would say the paradigm is here human security plus sustainable security um, 
for let's say man, mankind and, and we have to strive for that and for that it is best if if we had um, global standards as you say and and the code of conduct and here is where my questions come um one question that I have, is there a trade-off between a speed of implementation of the green transition and sustainable implementation locally? So do we lose time in addressing climate change if we go into the negotiations? Simply a question, is there a trade-off? Um, with regards out of out of Europe, if we strive for that, and I read all the efforts of, of the German government, but also the European Union to go for very green products to respect sustainable development goals, are we tending to lose out to other actors like China, Russia in Africa, for example? Um, and are we losing out only on the short term, which might be um, a, a big issue as well, or also on the long term? And the other point I, I would really like to understand better, and that's my final point, and sorry for being so long, um, how, how to implement these, this, this point of fry, free prior and informed consent if you don't, if companies lack the knowledge about the political institutions, if there is no clear interlocutors, which sometimes paves the way you simply go to the, the regional government or the national government, and then it's an easy way. So um, how to deal with these maybe in political institutional gaps? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Kirsten. Thank you for sharing your and your thoughts. And and yeah, I think there's a lot to to unpack here. Um, but we have we have one more speaker. Um, Christian, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Thanks, Jaime. Great, perfect. So Christian, Christian is going to to react from the perspective of of the private sector that um, develops and builds wind and solar farms around the world. Um, yeah, so, so Christian, um, the, floor, the floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> so thanks, thanks Anne, thanks, thanks uh, Hussein for, for sharing your knowledge with us. So um, it was really interesting to, to listen to all your, your knowledge you made. So I'm, let me just introduce myself and uh, ABO Wind. So I'm communications manager at ABO Wind, and um, I will start by explaining how how we develop renewable energy projects. And after that, I will go a bit more into detail about uh, the topic of the study and try to give you kind of a blueprint for project implementation in this context. Um, we are a small company compared to, to others, uh, other green energy. Sorry to interrupt you, Christian. Uh, can yeah. we see your full screen, please? Can you change the screens? Okay, I try to. Thanks. So now you see it? Now we see nothing. You need to share your full screen. So normally you should see it now. Still not, it's not that important. You maybe can change it in your full screen mode under options. Maybe in the top left under from begin on. Um, und links im Vorbild gibt es die Möglichkeit, einmal die Bildschirme zu tauschen. Bahnrad geben.
Sonst ist es auch nicht so wichtig vielleicht. So, just give me a second. Some technical problems really here. Otherwise, we can really just continue. I think we can we can see it also like that. <clears throat> Okay, so I just go on and so we are an owner managed company um, since 1996 and have currently about um, 1000 employees worldwide. We are uh, active in 16 countries. So um, some of them have pastoralists like South Africa, Tanzania and Finland, um, but we haven't have any contact points so far with the pastoralists. What we do, our core business is uh, the project development and con construction of wind, solar, battery and hydrogen projects. And in the long term, um, we also provide operations and maintenance services to all of the above projects. Um, so that makes us quite a bit unique in uh, as a company because we have all the four technologies combined. And um, yeah, so let me talk a bit about, about project development. So development and construction of wind and solar farms is quite complex as you can imagine. So it takes many colleagues from different departments working closely together over years and some steps take place at once, others vary from country to country. So that's important for us to, to know the country and that's why we are really represented in these countries and not just working from Germany. So we first identified potential sites with uh, professional geo-information system tools. And if these sites meet all the requirements we have, we contact landowners. And then that can be private individuals, also municipalities or state forests. And we, of course, um, like to talk to all the involved people. So after that, uh, our civil engineering designs uh, the wind farm or solar farm layout, arrange the turbines carefully to minimize impact on residents or local ecosystems. And they also try to use existing roads and open spaces to keep the, the area quite small, not like in Kenya and as Hussein told us. We also commissioned external experts to carry studies about shadow flicker, noise emissions, and of course, environmental effects of the turbines or solar farms. Um, our philosophy, and I think that makes, that is quite different from other companies, is to inform residents honestly and in an early stage. And I think that's really important to do that. So that improve acceptance, acceptance of our projects, minimize the risk as Hussein told us, and we regularly inform local residents about planned wind farms uh, or at public consultation events. And uh, I think it's really important to do that as soon as possible in the project, as early as possible, sorry. Um, and once we've carried out all the necessary steps, we submit all documents to the permitting authorities and also that process varies in different countries. So as a final step, we then start the construction and connect the wind or solar farm to the grid to produce the green energy. So we've read your study with great interest in principle, we see no fundamental conflict between renewable energy projects and pastoralism if you do it correctly. But to ensure this clear legal requirements must be created in the countries. So governments or overarching organizations such, such as uh, the World Bank should provide the framework within project planners like, like us may and must operate. So you can imagine companies that voluntarily adhere to moral compass will, will be at an economic disadvantage. So, and we will not be awarded with a contract if on the other hand, there are clear government regulations and, we can, uh, that renewable energy projects can also offer new opportunities for pastoralists as Hussein told us and Anne. So 
here it's also questions of good and above all joint ideas of the part of the partners. So we are, as I said, we are active in Finland, Tanzania and South Africa, but haven't had any touching points with pastoralists so far. So let me take Canada as an example. From our point of view, it would be a suitable blueprint because Canada now has very good regulations regarding the relationship between renewable energies and the First Nations. So there are two ways in Canada to strengthen the role of the First Nations here and that you, you can easily adopt to pastoralists in our point of view. So there are first uh, direct assistance. There's a so-called smart renewable subsidy program where the state subsidies stripes in terms of equity if they acquire more than 50% of a project, which is of course not easy if the project's getting bigger and bigger. Um, but for project developers like ABO Wind, there are specific rules in the public tendering procedures. And that's what is quite good in our point of view because here projects are evaluated in different categories. And among other things, there are awards for the involvement of the local population, especially with regard to the First Nations. Um, so how do we ensure a good partnership as a company? And as I said before, it all depends on early communication. So in, in Canada, we have so far worked with a local partner. So it's called Community Wind, and which has more than a decade of experience in building wind farms with municipalities, local community groups, and also First Nations across Atlantic Canada. This means that we talk to representatives of the First Nations at a very early stage, and they have all the network we need to, to talk to the right persons. So and in the meantime, we also have created a dedicated position for this purpose in Canada alone. So we were developing or are developing the Rodina wind project in Nova Scotia. And we started wind measurement in uh, 2019. So in that time, we already started to talk with property owners, the Mi'kmaq com community partners in an open house style. So we have still ongoing communication with the First Nation and other indigenous communities there and uh, the Eskasoni First Nation, which is uh, very active here, has provided us a letter of support for this project. Just because we talked to them in an early stage and also have uh, made out some, some good projects that, that we can offer them. So let me, let me tell you that in, in all our projects, what, what we try to strengthen this local value creation by, by contracting local companies for, for construction or clearing work. But um, as Hussein told, uh, told us, it's not always done by, by all the companies. Yeah. So that's Kristen, not easy we, because... We, Christian, yeah. we're seeing the slide number six. Maybe you can, if you can just um, um, move forward so that we can see the, the slide you're talking about. Thank you. Perfect. So talking about pastoralists, I think it's important that uh, they are well informed and well networked among themselves also. And I think that's the only way to ensure that in the end, all those affected benefit as equally as possible. So from our point of view, it would be good to promote social community projects instead of distributing money and what this could be in detail has to be discussed with each other at an, at, an, at an eye level. So like examples might be, I don't know, do, donations of, of solar ovens, depends on the, uh, the region, of course, or health posts or whatever. So that must be discussed in between the partners. And uh, that's what is important in our point of view. So. That's all so far. So if you've got any questions, feel free to ask them. And thanks for letting talk me to you today. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Christian. Um, yeah, that was really great, um, although we have some technical issues. And, and I think that um, sets up very well for a bit of, of Q&A from, from our participants. Um, 
And as we shift to, to the questions with the audience, I just would like to invite our participants to raise their hands in the Zoom application. And when I call your name, you can unmute yourself. And in addition to your question, please also mention um, your name, affiliation and country. Um, and also if, if a question is directed at, at one um, specific person. Um, you can also participate through um, through the Q and A um, section. So we will read out um, we will read the questions out loud, and and just please um, also say if it's um, if it's for one specific person. Um, the question is referring to one specific person, and so I would like to um, to open the floor for um, for discussion. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I see already some, some questions in the chat. Um, the first question, for example, is saying the title of the study mentioned green hydrogen, but, don't, but I don't see any case on green hydrogen. It's green hydrogen, a new concept in Kenya, as it is in South Africa. Um, yeah, I would. I can try to already answer that question. Green hydrogen is a new concept. Um, I think not only for Kenya or an or for for South Africa. Green hydrogen is a is a new concept for for a lot of countries, even for um, for countries in in Ger like like Germany. Um, and um, green hydrogen is produced by um, electrolysis of um, electrolysis. So it's 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 needed a lot of um, um, energy of electricity produced from renewable energies. So that's also the link to, to, um, to green hydrogen. Um, I hope that answers that question very briefly. Um, I don't know if someone else would like to, um, to um, say anything with, um, in relation to that question. Otherwise, um, yes, Anne. Please. Yes, um, I would like to emphasize we're trying to catch things in the bud before too much injustice is done, uh, before people move too quickly in the wrong direction. We know that there is going to be an increased demand for green hydrogen. And we know that green hydrogen, as you were saying, Jaime, has to be, uh, is dependent on a green produced energy such as solar and wind energy. Huh? And because this danger is there, this is what is coming. We have to make everybody aware. We have to make the governments aware, the companies aware, the pastoralists aware, other civil society organizations aware. Look, this is coming. We have to be prepared for it in a way that we can move ahead so that we have win-win situations for everybody and so that the pastoralists do not lose out. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for complimenting. Um, yeah, I have the, the next question is, um, yeah, it says um, South Africa is in a process of developing a just transition framework. And recently they have done a consultative process which included affected communities as well as um, renewable energy companies. Does Kenya have a framework or is considering developing one to protect pastoralists? Um, I assume that um, this question is uh, to Hussein. Yeah, I can. Yes, I think uh, for Kenya, um, we don't have any framework specific to just, trans just transitions to green energy. However, uh, from around uh, 2008, 2009, got coming forward, there has been a lot of conversations around generally land rights, because land, not only within the pastoral context, context, but even larger parts of Kenya, land ownership has been contentious and has been seen to be source of conflict. So Kenya, uh, with that conversation, it brought about changes within the constitution that sort of guarantees um, not only private land ownership, but also the community land ownership aspect. And later on in 2016, um, Kenya developed a law that allows communities to be able to register their land as communities. And that ownership 
uh, provides a kind of equal right to a private freehold ownership. And um, although this law has been in existence now for the last um, five, now going six years, the progress of course in its implementation has been very slow in certain way, certain aspects will say the governments uh, do not look really interested in supporting communities, communities also lack capacity and the know-how to be able to uh, use this law. And it is within this gap now that when energy projects or large scale energy projects and other um, investments that require large um, land acquisitions, they now use this gap because the land, are, land is yet to be registered. They take uh, land away. Although now, even as unregistered community lands, it's supposed to be under custody of local government that's supposed to protect. But again, also um, referencing also what Christian said, we do have some political or uh, gaps where uh, the people who are supposed to be protecting these lands are the ones, the same ones who, you know, perpetrate some of um, uh, these acquisitions, which are illegal even within the law um, in these given countries, taking uh, the advantage of the lack of know-how and the capacity of local communities to um, kind of defend and protect their land. So there's this, this is what the provisions that are there although not yet fully uh, implemented in Kenya. And um, we're still pushing to see what, what happens. And yeah, but the, court, the courts have provided some um, uh, yeah, limelights, you know, in, in terms of addressing some of those, it takes a lot of time. In the Lake Turkana case, for example, there was a positive kind of, uh, you know, court judgment in favor of the communities, which is quite rare. And we could see communities now taking that kind of example to protect their land. So. Those are some of the things that um, I can say about Kenya and the transition. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Um, I don't see any further questions or, um, um, yes, I have um, N and afterwards uh, you are from, yeah, please, N. I don't have a question. I want to respond to a question, a question that Kerstin post. Uh, she talked about the trade-offs and the speed of implementation. Do we have the time to go through these processes? Well, I think this is a case where you'll get to your objective, uh, to your destination more quickly if you go more slowly. Uh, you take the case that uh, Hussein was talking about, the positive case in Kenya, where the company and the local people did eventually come to an agreement. But if you go back into the history of that, it started, the idea and the conflicts actually started in 1993. And it took so long for the company to realize they have to take another tack. They have to invest in these relations with the local land users. And when they did eventually do this, then they were successful. Other companies failed. They had to give up. The equipment was destroyed. That's not getting ahead quickly. Thank you, and thank you, Anne. and we can we can um, continue with Jörg, and then I see a hand from from participants from Karen, Ben. Yeah, um, also referring to Kirsten's question about uh, trade off. Uh, I think the, I mean, broadly speaking, we are um, here talking about lands which are relatively marginal lands and which are. Uh, large, you know, large areas which are relatively sparsely inhabited. It's it's a the trade-off which we know, we you know as Germans, exists in relatively densely populated areas. And in Germany, I think there is a certain trade-off because you know Germany is a relatively small country and kind of densely populated. And you have that. Um, I would also say you can't wait until the very <laughs> every village agrees on everything. I, I would uh, say that's true. Uh, still, 
I would say in most of these cases, um, first of all, there are other possibilities. I mean, the, 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 the lands are not that scarce. And uh, so a company could go elsewhere. But second, uh, as uh, Anne correctly said, I would say, um, you know, a good preparation and consultation could could actually prevent further delays and damages and risks to the investment. So it's in a, in some way enlightened self-interest of a of our project developers. And last uh, but not least, I think there is um, there is de definitely also a uh, a question of um, kind of the longer term sustainability and the, the, the support for um, kind of renewable energies in the respective countries. You can also generate backlash so that, you know, essentially, you know, you have kind of a scorched earth in a, in a, in a region or in a, in a country that you, can, uh, that you may, you know, just get your project done. Uh, there are cases in, in, in Mexico, so where, you know, project work was a militarized and, and actually violent by project developers, but it creates a such a bad mute that actually it's it's kind of a, a, a pure victory for the for for green energy that you get a certain project done and and then future pro projects are largely uh, impossible. Mm. Thank you, Jörg. Uh, Kirsten, if you want to react to Anne's and Jörg's intervention before we go to Karen. Now, thank you very much. Um, and I hope I was clear that this was an open question because the, the normative answer to my question is very clear to me. And I, to me, and I said this, that we have to have the, the light built um, the, the, the paradigm of sustainable security with regard to human security and really sustainable projects. It was more the practical question, also comparing Chinese and European projects. Um, because, yeah, I hope first, I hope the approach is, is, is diff, different taken. Um, and then um, this is more the issue what I try to bring, bring up with regard to speed of implementation of, of projects. But indeed, I mean, in your case is right, we don't have that um, competition around very scarce um, land probably but to be very precise this was a very open question normatively the answer is, is very clear thank you thank you kirsten and i think uh karen uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now so you can pose your question there can you hear me yes okay i've been promoted to a panelist um my mother would be proud um thanks thanks so much for the for the research and the presentations um it it was really informative and insightful and i think it will really be very useful for the work that we're doing here um in south africa as the cape town office of the heinrich Bull foundation um i guess i have a kind of specific question and a broader comment slash question. I don't quite know how to categorize it. Um, but it really it has to do with um, just, you know, the, um, you know, the, the, the presence of, you know, the community benefit sharing conditions that I think Christian, you mentioned are in place in Canada. And I found that quite interesting, because I think because you also work in South Africa, you would know that we have quite similar uh, frameworks. So we have both a renewable energy procurement program that uh, was very prescriptive in relation to ensuring community benefits. And there's a relatively kind of long history, longish history of trying to ensure that communities also benefit from mining proceeds. Um, and even though those are in place as regulatory frameworks, um, in many cases, they haven't been sufficient to actually ensure that communities are properly consulted, um, that they do actually, you know, get investments that benefit them 
um, and um, that, um, yeah, it actually leads to, you know, an improvement and development of the area um, rather than a, a degradation of, of existing conditions. Um, and to me, that really speaks to the presence or absence of functional political institutions. Um, but I guess the question is, I mean, obviously we cannot wait for these ideal conditions uh, to be present before we do work. So perhaps, perhaps you could, Christian, you could reflect on, on your experience of doing this in South Africa and in Canada, um, and also around about, you know, how do you as a company act with integrity and ensure that, you know, you are doing no harm when there is an absence of, of um, very effective political institutions in place? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Chris, and we cannot hear you. Yeah, you thanks, to... Karen, for, for your question. And um, yes, yeah, I said, it's, it's quite difficult as in our point of view to, to shift the responsibility only to the project developers. But as, as you said, in, in some states, it's not easy uh, regarding the political system or the, the people the landowners, etc. So for us, it's it's important uh, if if new people start at ABO Wind, that we kind of do a good good job in onboarding them. What the company stands for. What is our way to to talk to people to integrate all the stakeholders in in the projects. So you will have to make sure that everyone understands how ABO Wind want to be and uh, how we act as a company but it's not always uh, easy to to do it in in every state as as you know because it's depending on the on the people working there so but in south africa it's uh, we are not that far in project development so we haven't uh, erected any wind turbines or solar farms so far so and, and we are not in this region where, for example, the Zulu live. So that's why, why my colleagues in South Africa told me that we haven't had any touching points yet. So, so we are at the very beginning of project development in South Africa, because as you maybe know, in, in Germany, it needs seven years to, from, from the first idea to, to the grid connection for a wind farm or a solar farm. It's a bit bit easier, but a uh, wind farm needs seven years in some states you need even longer. So that's why we haven't had any experience in South Africa so far. Thank you, um, Christian. Um, Anne, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, uh, yes, I, I would, because Karen uh, pointed out something very important, that there are many um, conditions, regulations that are set by in various agreements and government levels and so forth, and governments are signing these agreements, but it doesn't mean that they follow them, and it doesn't mean that the companies follow them. And I think for us, one of the most important things is that civil society organizations and especially pastoralist organizations are much, much better informed about what these regulations are, what their rights are, what companies are supposed to be doing but are not doing, and can bring that to the public, uh, can bring that to the government, can bring that to the world uh, that uh, injustice is being done. All right, thank you. And just to use the time, um, I see one more question here at the, in the chat, um, which is from, from, from Nairobi. Um, 
And the question says, um, for countries where power connectivity is less than 10% and still issues on energy justice um, are a concern, where will the balance be for um, trading in green hydrogen? Kenya is a good example of a country producing excess renewable energies, but with low connectivity. Um, yeah. Um, any reaction to, to this question? Um, Sam, would you like to respond to it? I, I don't really get the gist of it. Of course. Um, yes, Kenya produces quite a um, uh, large amount of green energy project, green energy, up to 70%, I think, of uh, Kenya's um, energy is from green sources. Uh, but however, um, issues of connectivity, of course, the energy is not at excess, but connectivity is an issue uh, that um, households that require this energy um, are yet to get connected. But then... Um, in cases of now where uh, connectivity is already low and then there are issues of um, justice around um, you know, development of green energy, then I think um, it, it makes the situation a bit complex. And in the sense that now um, countries need to invest um, um, in you know, making sure that um, if non-existence frameworks are developed and um, ready for use and where such framework exists, uh, like what we've said, there are some cases where even laws are there, but not followed, you know, in these countries where even issues of human rights, um, even if so detailed, even within constitutions are often uh, breached and uh, uh, there's no follow up. So I think, um, so it goes beyond, you know, just development of green energy, but rather uh, to now the aspects of uh, are developing political or social responsibilities within governance systems in countries. I think that's what I can say about that. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you so much. Um, I would like maybe um, to hear about Kirsten um, from your perspective. What what would you say? Uh, pardon. Uh, from the question that I that I just I can I can repeat it again. Um, for countries where power, um, where power connectivity is less than 10% and still issues of energy justice are a concern, where will the balance be for trading green hydrogen? Kenya, for example, is a, is a good example for mm. a country producing mm. excess yeah. renewable energies, but with low connectivity. This is this is this was my fourth point that I tried to mention. I think uh, I'm I'm still well, doing for quite some time analysis and research on, on and in particular these issues. And I, I'm, I'm, I think there are no easy answers because sometimes my hope is that export projects could help to kick off local structures. Um, but I think they have to be, it has to be ensured that they are very much in line with um, the NDCs and with the, the questions that, that we discussed right now, that it's, it has this win-win effects. Um, and I think it, this is not a, trivial in some cases, but um, this is exactly where we, we have to work um, and, and do the research in order to get a better understanding, even though I think there is not the one answer to, to every case, but I think it's, it's rather um, an understanding it case by case. And this makes a kind of regulatory framing um, very difficult because with too strict um, regulation, projects could be, yeah, uh, very difficult to be implemented, but might be might have good enabling effects. But this is, I think, it's really an issue case to case. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. And then we can move um, with the next question. Um, yeah, which says, okay, this study is about large scale energy projects, but could it not be more promising to think about small scale energy projects? many small bottom up um, than one big top down projects. Um, yeah, I think 
maybe Anne, um, do you have a, or Hussein? I'll let Hussein go first if he would like I, to otherwise. Yes. Yeah, I can uh, go first. Yes, I think uh, this is quite relevant. And um, what we see also here uh, in Kenya, and especially also in Northern Kenya, currently there's development of what they call mini off-grid, you know, solar power that um, targets, for example, a village. And this one now, it's small. So it requires a small amount of land. The village can always uh, volunteer this kind of land and also, it doesn't need this power to be taken elsewhere. So it is just, um, it supplies this specific village. And we've seen this, but now the context in which we are talking about this is where um, large scale energy is needed, you know, at um, within for say large, large towns, capital centers, and these are far off these dry lands. So the dry lands now become just the production source and then the energy is taken off to, to this, um, large towns, for example, like in Marsabit here, the electric kind of wind power, it produces all that energy, 300 megawatts, but we don't have the power here in Marsabit ourselves. So uh, the, all this contradiction. So the small ones can provide that local um, localized power supplies without um, much issues. That is what we have experienced in some of the centers. That's why the focus on, on these larger ones that do not really benefit the people uh, locally there, but taken off to other sides. And I can perhaps uh, add that uh, it even goes beyond the borders of the country. Uh, the investors and the governments are interested in uh, large scale projects uh, to be able to produce uh, energy for the big cities, as Hussein says, but they also see this as an opportunity for uh, income uh, for, uh, by exporting their energy or uh, by uh, using solar and wind power to produce green hydrogen. And um, that's something which large scale investors are interested in. Uh, but it should it doesn't argue against uh, small scale projects being done in the country. And um, yeah, I do hope that more emphasis is given to that indeed. As Hussein was saying, in these large scale projects, even the people that are in that particular area where the energy is being generated do not benefit usually from that energy. It's put into the national grid and it's gone. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you, Anne. Um, I don't see any, any questions in the Q&A section and I don't see any, I'm just checking. Um, oh yeah, there, I do see a hand, but I cannot see the, um, the name of that person. Maybe we can solve that out, um, the technical, but then before we do that, um, we go over to, to Jörg, if you have a comment. Yeah, I, I think, uh, frankly, the, the uh, small scale renewable energy projects are just serve a different purpose. If the issue is rural electrification for the local villages, etc., small scale projects are the way to go and they are good experiences and, and, and that's, that's just excellent. But if there is a need to serve the big cities. And even in, I think even in Africa now, more than half of the population lives in cities. I mean, urbanization is just you know, exploding worldwide. Um, if it is, there is the need to serve the big cities or even to produce green hydrogen for industrial purposes, then large scale projects are simply the, you know, more, the cheaper way to go and it would be really difficult and for not cost effective to produce this kind of house by house. So um, I think there is a space for both uh, small scale and large scale projects. But the large scale projects have that possibility to, you know, impact significantly on, on local livelihood. And that's exactly the discussion that we are having, what needs to be done, that the local communities is not negatively impacted and even could be positively benefit from um, from such larger scale projects. I mean, that's exactly the the task at hand, and uh, I think we have some leads in the study that uh, Anne and uh, and Hussein have produced. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. And now I see we have um, the person who was raising the hand um, can now unmute him, herself, maybe turn on the camera. You can pose your question directly, maybe say your name and your affiliation and, and country. Hello, um, our guest, you can now. Um, Marlies has question. her hand up, Marlies. Sorry? Marlies Case has her hand up, Dogmo Thomas has his hand up, Dongbo, Dongmo. Okay, yes, and then we'll just, in a few seconds, he will also be able to pose his question and then okay that was a mistake i see but don't know um um oh yes can you hear me yes oh okay sorry yeah so i was already posting um something about our work in the chat um so uh, maybe you can just say your name also. Yeah, and, yeah. And so uh, my name is Imo Olenberger, and I am um, uh, with Leipzig University. Was we are doing um, a project since 2018 on basically a very similar range of topics, but uh, northern Kenya and southern Ethiopia as a geographical focus. And I recognized uh, so many of the things that you know, like we also found um, in the presentation. So I thought this was very interesting, very to the point. Um, and um, I, would, I would think great work. Um, I uh, wanted to just a little aspect like from, from our research uh, region that has not been maybe stressed that much. So uh, the kind of, well, we have a, 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 a large range of interventions uh, we have the electric kind of wind power also there that has already been discussed. Um, but I would say that the uh, most dramatic case is actually bio biofuel development in the lower Omo, um, uh, part of Ethiopia, uh, which has uh, not been economically successful and has been disastrous for local communities and um, would also be bound to um, do significant ecological damage and uh, um, like we are trying to find, you know, not only criticize, but also find out solutions, um, you know, ways of bringing energy development in synergy with the, the potential of the region, which is to a large extent, uh, you know, and, uh, ecological um, based on biodiversity and on the capacities of indigenous people, especially pastoralists who are expert in using their environments, do that very efficiently, sustainably for thousand, six thousand years now. Um, and, uh, and we are trying to see like how that could be fit in to modern economies. Um, so, and I think uh, it's definitely possible that um, the, this, this kind of specialized pastoralist food production can coexist as has also been pointed out with uh, renewable energies like wind power, solar power, um, hydropower, and so on. And there can even be synergy effects. Uh, for example, if um, irrigation opportunities as given now uh, by the GB3 dam in Ethiopia would be used to support pastoralism, for example, uh, by producing um, dry season fodder. Uh, in fact, uh, pastoralists lose up to 80% of their stock during drought. So you could actually multiply pastoralist productivity if you would use these opportunities to uh, cut down those uh, those losses. And um, Thank uh, you. maybe a final Sorry point that it doesn't interrupt. get too long. Yes, <laughs> also, you know, there's a, a high potential for uh, high quality, low carbon food. Uh, you know, meat production is unsustainable the way it is. And this is an area where organic meat can be produced sustainably and meat is definitely to rise in value over the decades to come. And Ethiopia, for example, gets already a lot of income from that. Um, and so Thank that is a much better use than um, biofuel, which destroys ecosystems and would dry up Lake Tokana, by the way. 
Perfect, and thank you so much. But um, yeah, um, yeah. Sorry that uh, it was it wasn't a question, no but thank you, thank you for the comment. Um, and um, yeah, in view of the time, um, I would um, like to uh, thank everybody for for participating. Um, I will close the um, the open discussion, but before we close and before we go to my colleague Sarah, I would like to ask the, our panelists Anna, um, Anne Hussein, or Kirsten, Christian, if you would just to um, yeah to say a few words before um, um, before we close the the event. Well, I'll start just by saying that uh, I very much enjoyed the discussion and often having the also having the opportunity to learn about other similar studies that are being done. And I do hope that uh, these studies, not only our study, will help to raise much more awareness uh, in Germany and beyond Germany about uh, the importance of uh, generating renewable energy in a just way. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. And maybe very briefly, um, Hussein. Thank you, James. And um, it was an interesting conversation. And uh, I will say that, um, of course, given um, the happenings around the world, you know, the war in Ukraine, for example, right now, and droughts that we experience, um, the climate changing and requiring, of course, more uh, investment in green energy. There's this there's increased push, as already mentioned in the report, and the drylands are getting prominence for other uses as well. You know, as um, extractives are coming up, so competition for land for large investments are not only from green energy, but um, the good thing, for example, in Kenya here is there's that general enlightenment, enlightenment by the communities themselves slowly. You know about their land rights, about what they need to do. You know avenues. You know for um, uh, raising um, concerns and sometimes getting addressed. So I can see some positive uh, development with this kind of reports and conversations that we have that keep continues to enlighten and uh, uh, slowly uh, move us to just transition. Thank you. Great, thank you, Hussein. And over to you, Kirsten. Um, I just echo, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks to En and Hussein and all the others for the great presentations. And I, I would only end by saying, I think we need much more of these discussions to enlighten us and to get a better understanding and, and, and find good and yeah, just and sustainable solutions. Thank you, Kirsten. And last words of, of Christian. Yeah, thanks so much to all of you for, for sharing your, your study and your knowledge and for the comments and questions. So I think uh, what I, I learned today is how important it is to in involve the entire local population in the energy transition. And it's important that companies face up their responsibility for that. So and it's also important that governments uh, uh, face up their responsibility in this case. So. So thanks, Anne. Thanks, Hussein, for, for sharing and doing your study. And I hope to, to hear from you soon from, from your next studies. Thank you, Christian. And yeah, on, on from my side and on behalf of, of Bread for the World, um, I'd like to extend a big, big thank you to all of our, our um, panelists, and but also to all of our participants um, attendees for participating in, in this workshop and in this very fruitful um, discussion. Now I would like to, to hand it back to, to Sarah for, um, for some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Jaime. Um, and uh, besides thanking all our speakers, uh, I also wanted to, to thank um, the people behind the scenes, um, which helped to make this event possible. Uh, among them, our intern, Rai Bleile, who supported much in the preparation. Then we have Philip from our conference center and Felipe from uh, the technical service provider that also ensured that technically almost everything would out. We are still in the learning process, but I think it was nice that so many of you tried to intervene and uh, bring also your thoughts in. So thank you very much 
for this. Uh, we will take this with us and we hope you enjoyed the event and we also hope that you may join one of those uh, that are upcoming. Um, we have still some uh, publications in the pipeline, so we do want to encourage you to um, have a look from time to time on our hydrogen website uh, where we will keep everything updated and then uh, we will also have another discussion on the sustainability criteria we hope to to come up in our global synthesis process so thank you very much um, and we hope to see you all again and have a nice day